thank you for that wonderful call to music, musical call to worship. And uh, aren't we blessed to have a choir this morning? Thank you so much. Good morning. My name is Joan Wilms, and I am your worship leader today. And we are so glad that you could join us this Good Friday, whether here or online. Thank you to all the participants this morning and for the blessing of the choir. Recently, I have been listening to some devotionals focusing on the last seven statements Jesus made on the cross. For call to worship this morning, we will read those. I will ask you to join me in reading the red print, which are his words. As we read them, think about how they impact you, how they encourage you. First, Luke 23, verses 32 to 34. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Luke 23, verses 39 to 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. John 19, verses 25 to 27. Near the cr cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Mark 15, verses 33 and 34. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? John 19, verses 28 to 30. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, he said, It is finished. Luke 23, verses 44 to 45. It was now noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Let's pray. Jesus, we are so thankful for your great love that endures even the cross. We acknowledge how much you suffered and died for all our sins. 
We are thankful for your holy word that teaches us about you. Thank you, Lord, that as we worship today, as we focus on the cross, that we also know we worship our risen, living Redeemer and Savior. Amen. Good morning. It's a blessing to be able to worship with you this morning, and I wish you a, a blessed Easter. I ask you to stand with us as we sing and praise our Savior. You are the word at the beginning.
We want to sing two songs for you now. The first is called, And Can It, Can it Be? <clears throat> Excuse me. Familiar old words from Charles Wesley. And it poses questions. One question after another. Probing deep, deep into the mystery of the crucifixion. Deep into the mystery of what happened on the cross so long ago and what keeps happening also in our hearts, even this morning. Just a few words, the first few lines. And can it be? And can it be? Amazing love. How can it be? And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain? For me who him to death pursued? Amazing love. How can it be?
priest and stand to join us to sing, There is a Redeemer. Thank you for that wonderful singing and for the wonderful message in those words. For scripture reading today, I am going to be reading from Psalm and John and Hebrews. First, Psalm 22, 1 and 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, I find no rest. John 19, verses 28 to, 20 to 37. We have read some of these words already, but let's meditate on them again. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of red wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head, and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath, because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs on the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. 
The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Hebrews 10, 16 to 25. This is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for, those, for, for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your word, the Bible. Open our hearts and minds to your message given to us through Pastor Peter. Bless us and bless him as he speaks this morning. Amen. Pastor Peter. Good morning. Welcome here on this very special day. It is wonderful to have visitors among us, and we welcome you here as well. We're nearing the end of our sermon series, Journey to the Cross. We looked at why we should journey to the cross. We looked at Jesus' journey to the cross. Eric spoke on Israel's journey to the cross. Today, we will come to the cross as we look at the New Testament believers' journey to the cross. This past Sunday, we left the Jews behind at the cross, satisfied that they had done all they could to secure their position as the trusted leaders of the nation of Israel. But it was not just the priests, Pharisees, and leaders of Israel who followed Jesus to the cross. They were true believers as well. We read in Luke 23 that a large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and your children. John 19 continues with Jesus' words. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here's your son. And to the disciple, here's your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. Seeing Jesus there at the cross, on the cross, between two criminals must have been heart-wrenching for all of them. How was Jesus going to fulfill what we read this morning in Hebrews chapter 10? This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Remember that we have the benefit of hindsight. We have the benefit of having the entire Bible in our possession. 
We know what was going to take place on the third day. Sure, Jesus had talked about it, had predicted his death and resurrection, but really no one knew what that would be like, what that would look like. They were grieving for their teacher, the Savior, hanging on a cross, suspended between heaven and earth, condemned by man and abandoned by God. Sometimes we, like King David in Psalm 22, lament, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? God promised the Israelites in Deuteronomy, I will never leave you or forsake you. I believe that promise is true for us as well. He will never leave us nor forsake us. His true followers, once we commit to Him in faith and obedience, if we feel abandoned, alone, or forsaken, it's not that God has left us or withdrawn from us. It's because we have wandered away from Him. Instead of wandering away from God, Hebrews 10, verse 19 to 25 reminds us what we really should be doing. If you have a Bible or a device, please open it to the book of Hebrews. There are Bibles in the pew in front of you, though they are the ERV translation, and I'll be reading from the NIV version of the Bible. Hebrews 10, verse 19 to 25. The heading of the passage is, A Call to Perseverance in Faith. Hebrews 10, starting at verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain, that is His body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for He has promised, He who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Indeed, when we draw near to God, we need to draw near to God. In the good times as well as the tough times, the bad times, when we experience time of gain as well as when we experience loss. That is not to say that when we've been cleansed from our guilty conscience, things will automatically go well. While blessings will flow from Him who makes all blessings flow, our pain, our suffering, and sorrow will not autom automatically be washed away. Consequences to our actions still need to be dealt with. Our sins and former trespasses, yes, washed away, clearer than snow. The spear thrust into Jesus' side by one of the soldiers after Jesus had already died, piercing his lungs and heart, caused a sudden flow of water and blood to come out. We often read this and continue reading. But it is, in fact, a significant observation we read in John's account of Jesus' death. The blood signifies the fulfillment of the Old Testament covenants. They were sacrificing animals, and the blood was offered as an atonement for sin offerings. Jesus was the perfect Lamb, the Lamb of God, unblemished and without sin. His death was the final sacrifice of blood needed to fulfill the law, to atone for sins. The water that came out of Jesus' body signifies the New Testament covenant with believers. It signifies the cleansing waters. It signifies baptism. What's equally amazing is that some 500 years earlier, the prophet Zechariah prophesied that Jesus would be pierced. Let's look at that for a moment. The first verse in chapter 12 of the book of Zechariah is a prophecy, the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Then it continues in verse 10, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves, grieves for a firstborn son. 
On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be as great as the weeping of Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. I find this piercing so significant. I will repeat it one more time. Our sins are washed away. The spear thrust into Jesus' side by one of the soldiers, piercing his heart and lungs, causing a sudden flow of water and blood to come out. The blood signifies this fulfillment of the Old Testament covenants. They were sacrificing animals, and the blood was offered as an atonement for the sin of the people. Jesus was the perfect Lamb, the Lamb of God, unblemished and without sin. His death was the final sacrifice of blood needed to fulfill the law, to atone for sins. The water that came out of Jesus' body signifies the New Testament covenant with believers. It signifies cleansing waters. It signifies baptism. What wonderful imagery. That is the message of the cross, the reason Jesus journeyed to the cross, and the reason believers journey to the cross. Following Him in obedience means our eyes need to be fixed on Him and Him only. No sideways glances. No longing glances to see what we've missed, what we've given up. We've given up nothing of importance, but we've gained everything. We have gained everything of importance. The believers who were there at the cross, the women, the Lord's brothers, the disciples, and other believers who may have followed at a distance, heard Jesus in His darkest hour here on earth cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What happened shortly after Jesus' lament is recorded in John 19, verses 28 to 30, where we read, Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that Scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, and so they soaked a sponge in it, and the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus died on the cross and was placed in a tomb. It appears that the women, the disciples, and the followers, the believers who had physically journeyed to the cross, were surprised that Jesus died. And distraught was what he had been teaching them during his ministry years not going to come true. They were probably shaken by the abruptness of it all. Jesus had told them He was going to be resurrected. Still, they were surprised by His death. Other than Jesus and Lazarus, Jesus raising Lazarus and the little girl from the dead, no one had ever been raised from the dead. No one had ever been resurrected. At the end of the day, Jesus was dead and in the tomb. Most likely, the people at the cross that day were in shock. They were despondent. Perhaps they even felt like they lost their hope. Now they had to wait to see if if He would rebuild the temple in three days as He had promised. I know this is a rather abrupt ending to the sermon, but it would have been very abrupt for those witnessing the event there in person as well. One thing we know for sure, Jesus died for our sins, and He instructed us to celebrate the Lord's Supper that He had with the disciples the night before. Do this in remembrance of me, he said. The table is set. I invite you to join with the Lord in communion this morning. On the night before Jesus was betrayed, he sent Peter and John out, saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. When the hour had come, Jesus and His apostles reclined at the table, and He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. We do not celebrate Passover, as we have a greater sacrifice to celebrate. It was not a lamb that was sacrificed, it was the lamb of God who was sacrificed for our sins. Therefore, we celebrate the Lord's Supper to be in communion with Him. 
Well, we invite everyone here who proclaims Jesus Christ as his or her personal Lord and Savior, all those who know Jesus and walk with him to participate. It is important to remember that if there is resentment or unforgiveness in your heart, you may want to exclude yourself from participating as you do not want to eat or drink in an unworthy manner. This sacrament is between you and God. No one else can judge you or bar you from participating. Come as you are, for none of us are perfect but Jesus Christ. We are taking this sac sacrament in remembrance of His sacrifice on the cross all those years ago for our sins. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Servers, will you come up and join me, please? Let us reflect on 1 Corinthians 11, starting with uh, verse 23b. The Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed, took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do it in remembrance of me. As the bread is passed around, please hold it in quiet reverence until all are served. The trays have bread on the outside and rice crackers in the middle for those with allergies.
anyone been missed this morning? By eating this bread, a symbol of His body, we celebrate Christ's victory over sin. He was the perfect sacrifice for our sins, as He Himself was without sin. Let us pray for the bread. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, thank You for Your sacrifice on the cross for our sins, that Your body was given as a sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice for the sins of mankind, past, present, and future. Lord Jesus, we love You. It's incomprehensible what You did for us because we are never able to atone for our sins. Bless this congregation. Bless the bread that we take as a token, as a symbol of Your body that died when You died on the cross for us. In Jesus' name, amen. And we, when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that, brothers and sisters, is why we celebrate the Lord's Supper, to celebrate his death. So often we read in the Old Testament that the nation of Israel failed to continue in, their, in the ways of God because they forgot about the sacrifices made for them. We only have one sacrifice to remember, Jesus Christ hanging on a cross. After He died, a Roman soldier drove a spear into his side, mixture of water and blood came out. The blood, a reminder of the old covenant, where the, a perfect lamb was to be sacrificed. Jesus, our perfect lamb. Together with water, which is the other, sacram- sorry, the other sacrament we celebrate in this church, the water of baptism. Jesus' death covered it all, the Old, Testam- the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus is the bridge, the sacrificial lamb who fulfilled the law and the prophets, the Alpha and the Omega. Now, as we are ready to partake of the cup, I would ask again that when you take the cup, please hold it until everyone has been served, so that we may participate together. The cups in the center of the trays contain wine, the outer ones contain juice.
Has anyone been missed? Oh, the wonderful cross. By drinking the cup, a symbol of His blood, we celebrate Christ's victory over death. He was the perfect sacrifice for our sins, as He Himself was without sin. Let us pray for the cup. Father in heaven, thank You for sending us Your Son. Lord Jesus, thank You for the blood You shed on the cross for forgiveness of our sins, that we may do this in remembrance of You. Holy Spirit, thank You for living in our hearts, for being here this morning and explaining the message to us, for those who heard it for the first time, for those who have heard it many times. We thank You in Jesus' name. In the same manner, He also took the cup after supper, saying, the cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Thank you. Our benediction today is also a prayer. Please pray with me. Almighty and loving God, we thank you for your great love. You have fed us from our Lord's table and have assured us that your goodness to us never fails. We give you thanks that we are members of the body of Christ, heirs with Christ, and brothers and sisters in your family by your grace, assist us in our journey, that we may go forth strong and faithful in our witness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand and join us to sing.
is God.